Good morning, everyone. This is Christine Nicholas, Chair of New York State Tourism Advisory Council, and I'd like to call the meeting to order. It is now 11.04 a.m. And due to public health concerns, and as authorized by executive order by the governor, this meeting will be conducted virtually, and the public may watch via webcast. And I do hope it will be the last meeting we have virtually, uh, since things seem to be moving in the right direction. I will start by taking attendance and I will call the names from the RSVP list that I have here. Um, and we will, you'll have to unmute in order to um, mark yourself present. Barbara Lee Diamondstein Spielvogel. Dan Fuller. Is that, I hear Dan, was that Dan that said I'm here? Okay, Tom Mulroy, I know you're here. Yes, I'm here, Christine. Very good, thank you. Anthony Davidovitz, welcome to your first TAC meeting. Thank you, I'm here. Good. David Filipiak. Hello, Christine, I'm here. Hi. Valerie Knobloch. Here, Christine. Very good. Catherine Nichols. Good morning, Christine, I'm here. Good morning. Eleanor Tatum. Okay, Alana Petroselli. Ali Sirota, I believe you're on the phone, right, Ali? I'm here. Okay, terrific. So. George Demolis. I'm here. Very good. Assemblyman Danny O'Donnell. I am present, Christine. Very good. Um, and then we have the I Love New York ESD staff. Um, I know Ross, Kelly, and Rich, you're all present. Thank you so much for all your help. Um, and then we have some um, guests, which we will hear from in a little while. And is there any TAC members who I did not call that may be here? No? Okay, we're going to move ahead. Um, all members have been emailed a copy of the minutes, and they're also available on the ESD website. Um, if there are any changes to the minutes, please say so now. No changes being um, recorded. May I have a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve, Catherine. Thank you, Catherine Nichols. And I need a second. Second, Ali Sirota. Thank you, Ali Sirota. All in favor, or I'm going to say any opposed because... It's hard to do this virtually. So any opposed? Okay, then the motion carries, minutes are approved. And at this time, I'm going to ask that everyone to please go on mute if you're not speaking. I'd like to um, begin with everyone's reports. I'm pleased to announce that we do have a new uh, advisory council member joining us who I'd like to formally welcome, Anthony Davidovitz is a practicing lawyer and deputy director of legal operations, administration and legal affairs at Storm King Art Center. Since 2011, he has overseen and developed several areas, including finance, buildings and grounds, communications and community relations and visitor services. Anthony serves on the town of Cornwall Economic Development Advisory Committee, town of Cornwall Comprehensive Planning Committee, the Russell Wright Museum Finance Committee and the Orange County Arts Council as vice chair. Welcome to TAC, Anthony, and would you like to say a few words? Very happy to have you. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, only to say I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of this council and look forward to contributing as best I can. Very good. Well, we're happy to have you and look forward to working with you. Um, over the past two months, there's been a flurry of announcements about loosening capacity restrictions and increased business reopenings, which Ross will cover. There has also been a variety of tourism related infrastructure and other projects that will help boost our industry as we build back better. I'd like to highlight some of those announcements from my report. As of early May, construction is complete for the historic $1.5 billion Jacob K. Javits Convention Center expansion. The massive project, which will add 1.2 million square feet of total event related space on Manhattan's west side was completed on budget despite the challenges related to COVID. Expanding the Javits Center, which has been operated as the busiest convention center in the, in the US, furthers Governor Cuomo's efforts to continue New York City's role as a leading tourism, hospitality, and business destination, 
and the project serves as a key part of the Midtown West redevelopment plan, including the transformational of the transformation of Pier 76 directly behind the six block convention center. With state-of-the-art equipment and cutting edge technology, the expanded Javits Center will feature 50% more front of house and back of house areas, including new exhibit and meeting room spaces, a glass enclosed rooftop pavilion, and a truck marshalling facility that will accelerate event operations and reduce traffic congestion. These improvements will allow Javits and New York to compete for more shows and conventions as the size and needs of events have grown since the convention center's opening 35 years ago. And we have a video of the newly constructed space that we'd like to share with you now. Okay, very nice. Uh, the Metro North Penn Station Access Project, which has been paused by COVID-19 pandemic and the MTA funding uncertainty will resume. The reopened RFP process will select a firm to design and build four new Metro North railroad stations and make track upgrades in the Bronx. The project will bring four fully accessible Metro North stations to the Bronx at Hunts Point, Park Chester, Morris Park and Co-op City. Trains stopping at these stations will serve as an extension of the New Haven line, offering rail commutation options in the East Bronx to Midtown Manhattan, as well as points in Westchester County and Connecticut. The commute from Co-op City to Penn Station, currently 75 minutes, will be cut to 25 minutes. The commute from Hunts Point to Penn Station, currently 45 minutes, will be cut to 16 minutes. This will also create new options for visitor visitors to venture out into the boroughs and experience all that New York City has to offer. And I, you may wonder, well, why are we raising this attack if this is mostly for commuters? Well, I will say, um, as one of those commuters on Metro North, more and more visitors stay in the sub suburbs and then, and then commute, or they use the, com the commuter rails to come in um, and become tourists, not only in New York City, but in Westchester and Long Island. So this is a win-win for all, or will be a win-win for all. Um, the Niagara Falls Visitor Center. Uh, Niagara Falls State Park will build a 46 million state-of-the-art visitor center. The new facility will be a gateway to adventure along the Niagara River corridor, greatly improving the visitor experience, complementing nature, increasing the length of visits within the park, expanding the park as a four season destination and enhancing awareness of nearby recreational and cultural offerings. The new 28,000 square foot visitor center will include new ticketing and information desks, interpretive museum space, including an immersive experience and exhibits, highlighting a diversity of topics, including natural, industrial and indigenous American history new concession spaces, restrooms, and associated support spaces. The governor announced that the great New York State Fair will indeed take place this summer. The 2021 reimagined New York State Fair will take place in Gettys Forum, in, in Gettys from August 20 to September 6, and the fair and fairgrounds are being planned and prepared in accordance with the Department of Health's COVID-19 health and safety guidance. As public health conditions and the guidance changes, the fair will adapt and adhere to all applicable health protocols, such as capacity restrictions, social distancing, face coverings, and health screenings where necessary. Current plans are for daily admission to be limited to approximately 50% of capacity for the areas available for guests to allow for social distancing. Capacity limits will be re-examined and adjusted and will comply, of course, with all health and safety guidelines. The fairgrounds buildings will not be open to the public except for the bathrooms. People buying food and drinks will be advised to sit while they eat and drink and ample tables and dining spaces will be made available. Midway rides, games and attractions as well as all surfaces of frequent customer contact will be rig rig rigorously and frequently 
cleaned and sanitized. Mm -hmm. Tickets will be sold for each of the outdoor areas so families can decide which areas they want to visit and plan their day accordingly to ensure capacity limits and social distancing attendance at concerts and other live performances will also be limited. Excuse me. <clears throat> Governor Cuomo announced a partnership between the Empire State Trail and the nationally known Boilermaker Race to create the Empire State Trail Challenge, a four month virtual race where participants can register and log their miles to reach milestones tied to the virtual progress of the Empire State Trail. Registration began in April and participants can log their miles walking, running, or cycling through July 31st. Participants would compete, uh, will complete the mileage of at least one leg of the Empire State Trail, either the Hudson Valley Trail, the Erie Canal, uh, Canalway Trail, or the Champlain Valley. New York Stewart International Airport. Three major Port Authority initiatives to be re-energized. New York, New York Stewart International Airport and the surrounding region were announced in late March. The Port Authority unveiled a new air carrier incentive program, a new airport marketing campaign to attract interest from across the airline industry to Stewart, and the completion of a new federal inspection station first announced by Governor Cuomo in January of 2018. Given its location in the heart of the Mid-Hudson region and its access to New York City, New York Stewart is uniquely positioned to serve important segments of air travelers, including international business and leisure travelers, especially as COVID-19 restrictions are relaxed across New York and beyond. Upstate airport economic development, 250 million is available to transform and modernize airports in upstate New York and foster regional economic development. The completion is open to upstate commercial passenger service airports and airports providing specialized service for commercial aircraft corporate jets. Applicants may apply for funding a single project or a program of projects that will help meet the demands of the 21st century, like improved security screening, terminal expansion and rehabilitation, state-of-the-art boarding concourse and concession areas, opportunities to move passengers more safely and efficiently, and improve distancing during and after COVID pandemic. New innovations in contactless technology and increased focus in cleanliness and, and disinfection. I'm just gonna take a moment to remind everybody to just put on mute, please. Ah. So it's clear that the, despite the setback from COVID, the state and the governor have continued to forge ahead with the large scale projects that will have a tremendous positive effect on tourism in New York, like the Javits expansion, Niagara Falls Visitor Center. And we look to invite invest visitors back to New York State. Each of these events or projects will greatly enhance the state's tourism product and ensure travelers have a world-class, one-of-a-kind visit. Now, I turn it over to Ross Levi, who has several updates for us with his I Love New York report. Ross? Thanks so much, Christine. Good to be with you and with the tech again, uh, particularly now, uh, because I think it's clear uh, that the New York State and probably the nation has turned a page uh, when it comes to emerging from COVID. Uh, and I think all the activity in the tourism space is reflecting that. So that's obviously exciting news for us. Um, it's striking to think about where we were in March just uh, two months ago and compare that to where we are now. Uh, you'll remember that at the last meeting, I gave an update on the reopening guidelines as I've done it at all the tech meetings throughout the pandemic. And at that time, uh, we were seeing some businesses just being allowed to reopen. You know, we were talking about outdoor amusement parks. Um, and then there were others that were operating at a very limited capacity, just 20 or 35%. And while everyone was obviously happy to see things coming back online, there was still a sense of trepidation. Um, but fast forward to today, and I think we're in a very different place. Most businesses are restricted only by social distance requirements. I'll be talking about that. And the CDC has said, uh, for those who are vaccinated, you no longer need to wear masks in most outdoor or even indoor settings. Um, and there's been a flurry of announcements in the past few weeks that have dramatically changed how our industry can function. So I wanna start by going over those. Um, as of May 19th, New York State adopted the CDC's interim public health recommendations for fully vaccinated people for most businesses in public settings. 
Um, so for example, for mask rules, the state has authorized businesses to set their own rules to continue to require masks for all in their establishments consistent with the CDC guidance. But in most cases, the state does not require vaccinated individuals to wear a mask. Uh, unvaccinated individuals under both CDC and state guidance must continue to wear masks in all public settings. Um, as far as business capacity, businesses are now only limited by the space available for patrons or parties of patrons to maintain the required social distance of six feet. Um, so it's no longer about capacity, it's about distance. Given that the CDC has advised that fully vaccinated individuals do not need to maintain social distance, businesses may even eliminate that six feet of required social distance and therefore increase capacity if all patrons within the establishment um, or a separate designated part of the establishment present proof of full vaccination status. Uh, for areas where vaccination status of individuals is unknown and for patrons who do not present proof of full vaccination status, the required social distance of six feet still applies. When it comes to small and large scale events um, for the social gathering limit of 250 indoors or 500 outdoors, Venues will be able to require masks for all patrons and social distancing of six feet will be required between parties of attendees unless, again, all attendees present proof of full vaccination status. Unvaccinated people should still wear masks and DOH strongly advises that masks be worn indoors by everybody when vaccination status is unknown. And then for large scale events that exceed the state social gathering limits, Event venues are only limited by the space available for patrons, as I was saying, or for parties of patrons to maintain the required distance. Um, unvaccinated attendees and um, attendees who have an unknown vaccination status must continue to remain spaced six feet apart in assigned sections. Uh, masks will be required in indoor event settings, except while seated uh, and eating or drinking. Uh, fully vaccinated attendees, on the other hand, may be spaced directly right next to each other. Um, at 100% capacity in assigned sections that are designated solely for fully vaccinated individuals. And in those cases, masks are optional. Uh, venues must verify vaccination status to take advantage of those reduced social distancing requirements. So you can see that's a pretty significant di uh, difference from moving from these different levels of capacity to focusing much more on how far away people are and whether they're vaccinated or not. There were, other some, uh, there were some other very significant guidelines for reopening uh, when it comes to the tourism world. Uh, Broadway tickets are now on sale. Very exciting uh, for shows starting September 14th. Uh, we know how important that industry is for tourism. Um, so we're excited that uh, tickets are being available now uh, for shows starting September 14th, uh, available at 100% of theater capacity in most cases. Uh, beaches and pools will operate with six feet social distancing in anticipation of Memorial Day with the goal of having 100% capacity by July 4th. Uh, many professional sporting events, including the Yankees and the Mets and the Blue Jays up in Buffalo, at least temporarily, uh, the Islanders, the Knicks and the Nets, um, there are fully vaccinated fan sections where individuals are seated right next to each other in assigned seating. And then non-vaccinated individuals will be spaced six feet apart in other sections. Um, we were excited that not only in addition to the New York State Fair that Christine talked about, that county fairs and festivals can take place if approved by their local government um, or the state DOH for events with over 5,000 people that require the state DOH approval. And they are limited only by space available to maintain social distancing uh, unless attendees provide proof of full vaccination, in, way, in which case you don't even need to keep those uh, requirements. Uh, we were excited to hear that the New York City Marathon will return for its 50th running this year on November 7th. Um, it will be operating at 60% of its usual participant field for a total of 33,000 runners, but still very significant um, for the return of that really important uh, event. Uh, Radio City Music Hall will be hosting the Tribeca Film Festival's closing night film on Saturday, June 19th at 100% capacity, a fully vaccinated audience uh, going there to Radio City Music Hall. And this will be the first in-person film festival to take place in all of North America since the COVID-19 pandemic began. And we're obviously very proud that New York State will be the home of that. So these announcements are significant and seem to represent a new day for tourism. 
Um, we know that they'll lead to questions and we are constantly working to keep the industry updated in real time as we have new information. Um, in the meantime, we urge everyone to keep checking and regularly check the New York Forward website um, for the specific detailed guidance, specifically as that is being updated really almost daily at this point. So I think these openings have helped create a real sense of hope that we're finally on the precipice of a new period of regrowth and renewal for tourism. Um, I dare say we're in a better position than many of us thought we might be just a couple months ago. Um, and that progress is, we're, is mirrored in consumer sentiment as well. The consumers are really feeling this hope as well. Um, we've been tracking a national sample to understand current and future travel intent. Um, and those stats are looking very encouraging. 70% say they plan to travel with the same or greater frequency as they did pre-COVID. 81% um, are hoping to take a leisure trip in the next six months, uh, indicating a considerable pent up demand and enthusiasm for traveling again. And among that group of 81% who said they'll be traveling in the next six months, over half, 52% have already made some sort of commitment to travel. They've either booked a hotel or they've booked a flight or a rent a car or a vacation package. Um, so in short, it shows that consumers are ready to go. Uh, the guidelines are allowing those businesses to operate. So New York State is largely open. Optimism is warranted. And we are very well suited to take advantage of the bottled up demand. Specifically, what are we doing um, to encourage travelers to visitors to New York State? Uh, well, as you know, and I reported at the last meeting, I Love New York received funding in the 2021-22 state budget on par with pre-COVID years, um, allowing us uh, to put together as we are currently doing a similarly robust marketing and advertising effort, utilizing all the platforms that we have in the past. Um, and on our own channels, we continue to churn out creative blogs and social media content um, as we continually adapt to this uh, new normal that we're in. Uh, we post update, uh, we post new content daily, but I wanted to highlight just a couple of things of particular note since the last TAC meeting. Um, taking advantage of the fact that families, couples, and friends are increasingly indicating a desire for road trips uh, and looking like the Great American Road Trip is back as they venture out on post-pandemic getaways, we produced a series of road family road trip blogs with ideas of what you can do from driving across the state from Albany to Niagara Falls, um, touring the Adirondacks, exploring Cayuga Lake and the Finger Lakes, or seeking out the scenery of the Catskills. Um, Earlier in March, uh, we launched a competition seeking design concepts for an official mascot for the Lake Placid 2023 World University Games. You'll remember from previous TAC meetings uh, that uh, where we announced that Lake Placid won the bid for the World University Games in 2018. Um, and we'll be welcoming thousands of athletes, their families and spectators in 2023, just a couple of years away. Um, it is the largest amateur sporting event in the world after the Olympics. Um, so it's a very big deal for New York State and for tourism. Um, this mascot uh, that is being selected will serve as a highly visible symbol of the games uh, to help attract that global audience. We received over 100 entries from all corners of the state and thousands of votes from the public for their favorite mascot design concept uh, to be used as a costumed character, um, to be on t-shirts and toys and souvenirs and all kinds of other things. Um, so right now a panel of experts is judging the entries that were chosen as finalists uh, by our website followers. Um, you can see those finalists on the screen there in front of you. And we look forward to announcing which entry has been chosen uh, as the winner, most likely at the next tech meeting. The 2021 Spring Path of History Weekend is uh, just a few weeks away, taking place on June 19th and 20th. We're inviting all historic and heritage sites to participate with either live on-site events, virtual events, or a combination of the two, still remaining flexible, recognizing that uh, different attractions are in different places in terms of their offering to the public. We've started promoting event registration and e so far already have 35 events signed up and anticipate many more generally we get into the hundreds with these events. Um, if any of you on the TAC um, would like to uh, participate or know of any attractions that would like to participate more likely, uh, please pass the word along. 
um, and have them be in touch with uh, Heather McElhenney on the I Love New York team. So in addition to all that consumer work and making sure that our followers are informed and inspired about uh, what's available for them for visitation in New York State, we continue to support uh, New York State's tourism industry, whether that's through informing them of funding that's available, uh, staying connected to their efforts, um, or developing industry engagement programs. Uh, so for example, in the funding world, in mid-May, Governor Cuomo launched round 11 of the Regional Economic Development Council initiatives, the REDCs, officially kicking off a new decade, it's 10 years that it's been in operation, uh, of economic development in a post-pandemic recovery. The 2021 uh, funding round consists of more than $750 million in state economic development resources. And as part of that, uh, there is a projected 15 million available for Market New York uh, for the 2021-22 fiscal year, specifically for tourism marketing and tourism capital projects, uh, with a particular emphasis this time around, obviously, on projects that help tourism rebound from COVID. So the consolidated funding application, the CFA, opened on May 10th. So businesses and municipalities and not-for-profits can all now begin applying for grants uh, from dozens of state programs for job creation and community development projects. Uh, we obviously are particularly interested in those market New York tourism projects. So information on how to apply and important dates uh, and deadlines uh, is all available at the Empire State Development Market New York page, uh, the specific page on the Empire State Development website with information on that. Also in the area of funding, uh, in addition to the opening of CFA, this past month, we were able to announce that 1.9 million in matching funds will be available to the county tourism promotion agencies uh, across New York State for quarters three and four of this year. Uh, we weren't sure we were going to be able to have any matching funds available for 2021. So we're happy to say that starting July 1st, there are six months of funding that will be available to support the tourism promotion efforts of our county and regional TPA partners. So we're very happy about those matching funds. We've also uh, been participating in the efforts of our industry partners. Uh, the New York State Tourism Industry Association, NISTIA, uh, held its 2021 New York State Tourism Conference. It took place virtually April 21st to 23 under the theme, Planning to Thrive, appropriately enough. Uh, the conference featured speakers like Don Welsh, the president and CEO of Destination International, and Christopher Thompson, the president and CEO of Brand USA, as well as many of our colleagues from across the state. Um, I Love New York was asked to join as presenters during several of the days. Um, for example, I delivered a uh, outdoor welcome uh, from Washington Park in New York, trying to combat Zoom fatigue and switch up settings to actually get outside for a, a video presentation. Um, Lisa Soto from the I Love New York team with Finn Partners, our PR firm, hosted a PR workshop during a lunch and learn session. Uh, our own Kel Kelly Garofalo discussed the Accessible New York program during a uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity panel. Uh, and I also uh, presented our annual I Love New York report during the last day of the conference. Um, I just want to show you those outdoor remarks uh, that we delivered there. Good morning, friends. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the 2021 New York State Tourism Conference. We are once again able to gather as a community to reflect and learn from one another, thanks to the hard work and dedication of the New York State Tourism Industry Association Board of Directors, and especially its staff, Bob Provost and Christine Hofer. We are very grateful for Nistia's service to our industry and the support you have provided as host of the conference. This opportunity to get together, even virtually, is particularly important in these times. How do we want to describe them? Challenging, difficult, unprecedented? The adjectives are all cliched at this point, but that's because they're true. Simply put, this is a period unlike any other faced by the tourism industry. You've heard Governor Cuomo refer to COVID as scaling a mountain, and I think that's an apt metaphor. When you climb a mountain, even after you've reached the peak, you still have to be smart and safe to get to your ultimate destination on the other side. The task isn't over, even when the worst is behind you. There is still lots of hard work that needs to be done. Fortunately, every day things get a little bit easier. As an industry, 
This is where we find ourselves now, at the transition point between the grueling climb to the summit, but not yet where we can declare the quest complete. We started with a long, precarious journey in front of us, not exactly sure of what path to take. So what was our first reaction? To get on the phone with one another, share what we were doing, and equally important, share what we were feeling. I think that speaks volumes about New York's tourism community. Those regular calls established by Nestia became our touch point, our base camp, if you will, where we could share our struggles, our learnings, and our small successes, each of which motivated us to move further and further forward. Over the course of the pandemic, we've worked together as a team to clamor and push each other to the top. Now that we've made it over the summit, the sun is shining a little brighter. We can feel its warmth and its promise a little more. We can take a moment to assess where we are, appreciate how far we've come, and catch our breath before we start on the still challenging path ahead. We must continue to work together to complete the voyage and build our industry to even greater heights than before. My I Love New York colleague, Kelly Garofalo Wilkins, found a quote on the website, We Dream of Travel. It says, quote, some mountains only require a good pair of shoes. Others require an entire team to conquer, knowing which is the key to success, unquote. Luckily for our industry here in New York State, we're familiar with hiking and we know the difference. For this, we need a team. And we are so fortunate to have all of you, such a passionate, talented, resilient, and yes, New York tough and loving group of individuals leading our tourism industry. We are honored to partner with you on this journey and look forward to drawing inspiration from each other during this conference and beyond to reach our ultimate destination of a better, stronger New York State. Thank you. So it was, it was a great conference, uh, lots of insights and conversations all geared towards that idea of building New York's tourism industry back better, uh, how we can uh, not just be here, but thrive. Um, so I want to thank and congratulate the Nestia board, uh, the conference planning committee uh, and their staff, Bob Provost. And you heard me mention Christine Hofer, who I uh, want to recognize, um, you know, she's just recently left that organization after many years of service. Um, so we want to uh, thank and recognize uh, Christine for her service to Nestia and the tourism industry as she's moved on uh, to other exciting professional uh, opportunities. Um, on May 5th, uh, I joined Visit Binghamton, Visit Buffalo Niagara, Visit Rochester, Visit Syracuse, and the Lieutenant Governor, Kathy Hochul, at a virtual press event to officially launch uh, the Upstate Eats Trail. Uh, it's a new initiative by all those partners I mentioned, featuring a 225 mile long trail highlighting regional restaurants, roadside stands, corner uh, taverns, diners, ice cream shops, all those places that make some of the most authentic regional food specialties in the United States. Uh, runs literally from Western New York through Central New York, connecting Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, and Binghamton. Um, that press event was picked up by some major outlets, including Time Out and Food and Wine Magazine. Uh, and we are excited to promote the trail to visitors to New York State. Um, I encourage all of you to check out their new website, upstateeatstrail.com, so you too can plan your next uh, New York State food adventure. We also continue to support our industry with an educational webinar series. Um, the most recent one, a PR-focused workshop hosted on April 14th, uh, was entitled The Road to PR, Travel PR in a Changing World, and it covered how the media landscape has changed uh, how to pitch journalists in the current media environment, the best ways to showcase your destination in the absence of press trips, which we know are challenging in the current environment, uh, best practices for hosting a compelling event and determining news value, and how to work with I Love New York in pitching New York and all its wonderful attributes to writers looking for new and fresh content. The workshop was specifically geared towards our TPA partners, and we were pleased to get uh, 50 of the 62 county and regional TPAs uh, to be a part of that. I'm going to show you a very clip now of that webinar so you can see how it went. Um, um, the partners across the state and also just to reiterate if you know a piece of that information doesn't get into the story that we're currently working on with a writer 
I have a very large folder of <laughs> all things New York. So it is used for pitching months, years, whatever down the road. So it is much appreciated. So that gives you a sense uh, of, of the way that went. It was very well received. Um, and we continue to uh, be told that the bar is being set higher and higher with each of these subsequent uh, workshops. Our next offering is going to be about helping the TPAs to utilize their listings features on ilovenewyork.com and the I Love New York mobile app, since it's such a great tool. Um, and then there'll be additional educational offerings that are coming after that. Um, our team member, David Contreras Turley, along with Heather McElhenney, um, and many other members of the team working hard on that effort. Um, since our last meeting, we also completed our Tourism Workforce Initiative pilot program. Uh, you'll remember that we, uh, this is the first time that we worked together with the New York State Department of Labor um, for a series of uh, virtual job fairs that were held. Uh, we had four since our last TAC meeting. Uh, that was in addition to the ones we had before that. Um, so when all is said and done, we've basically covered the majority of the state. Uh, since we last met on April 15th, there was a tourism pavilion at the Finger Lakes Regional Job Fair. On April 29th, a tourism pavilion at the Southern Tier Regional Job Fair. On May 6th, a tourism pavilion at the Western New York Regional Job Fair. And then on May 20th, a tourism pavilion at the North County Regional Job Fair. Um, we have a screen that you um, can look at here as I'm talking um, that is actually a recording of the platform. You can see what this virtual job fair looks like and how it functions. It's really quite dynamic. It, it's as close as you can get on computer to actually being at an event. Um, our early feedback so far from the first I Love New York Downstate virtual job fair um, and from the survey respondents, uh, we got some feedback. More than half reported that they would participate in a in our virtual job uh, career fair again so that's a, a pretty good sign for a pilot um, and then we're waiting to hear feedback from the subsequent fairs but they seem to have been very well received as well so we expect to do some additional outreach um, so that we can literally see how how this did and how the program can be refined and improved but there's a high high likelihood that this program will be continued in the future we feel very good that we were able to do this even during covid um, and the idea of continuing that in non-covid time um, is an exciting prospect. So as you can see, uh, we've been pretty busy with the industry, uh, with consumers, um, and working during this period of COVID emergence. Uh, and I, but I dare say our busiest months are ahead. Um, so um, we expect to be reporting on much more uh, at the next TAC meeting. And that concludes my report, Christine. Thank you so much, Ross. Does anybody have questions for Ross? Anthony. I had, I had a question. Um, Ross, that was, that was terrific. Obviously, my first meeting here, if they're all that comprehensive, it's going to be a, a wonderful ride. And I thought your video was really great. I really like that. Um, I did have a question about uh, targeting. You were talking about the groups that you're following um, and their intention to travel. I'm wondering whether that you have any sense of whether that intention is local, regional, international, um, and how that impacts your, your work and outreach. Right, yeah, my colleague, uh, Rich Gagliano is on the phone, may wanna uh, address that directly, uh, but uh, I'll just mention, um, obviously International has its own challenges at this point with the borders and we're watching them closely to see that travel return, um, but we've remained active, even you know our I Love New York offices overseas have remained open, um, granted on a scaled down way, but that we can stay in touch with the industry there on at least a, a B2B way um, and utilizing that time. So particularly as tour operators and travel agents could be uh, aware of New York State, a lot of them told us that they had more time since they weren't working as directly with clients to learn about New York State. So we, we've been working with them. So international, I'll, I'll sort of put aside a little um, recognizing that we need uh, the borders to open to, to do that more forcefully. Um, but we have been watching the market. So Rich, I don't know if you want to directly answer that question. Sure, yeah, to Ross's point, we've been keeping an eye on the needs of, you know, throughout the whole lockdown, you know, what, what the different rules are for different states, um, long or whole travel within the country, international, so as Ross mentioned, we're you know working hard right now on you know efforts that will we can we can share a little more details in the future on that. But that's one of the things we've been looking into. What are the different needs? So it's not a one size fits all. You know what are we doing to keep um, the international market still top of mind? 
keep keep New York top of mind amongst the international market while you know we wait for the borders to open up widely versus what we do locally versus what we do upstate versus what we do in neighboring states versus what we do from a more longer haul you know visitor from across the state. So that's what we've been keeping an eye on and digging into right now and working through those specifics. But yes, we are targeting each of those groups um, as needed based on the, uh, the potential opportunities against them. Thank you. Great. Anybody else have any questions for Ross? Okay. Okay. Well, I'd like to jump into um, a bit of a discussion now. Um, you know, it's been interesting to see um, recently. Uh, there's been an increase in, in talk about high speed rail. And it's not, it's upstate. There are two senators, uh, Senator Cooney and Senator Kennedy, who introduced some legislation about um, increasing high, high speed rail. They're from Buffalo and, and Rochester and what it would mean for upstate. And then um, Long Island Newsday just did a very big feature, and they have some. Um, local electeds there who believe that Long Island would greatly improve if they had high speed rail there. And then when you, um, you know, when I Googled it thinking maybe this will be something interesting for TAC, there seems to be an increase in this build back better, right? This opportunity that we have post COVID and whether or not high speed rail should be part of that. So I wanted to just have a discussion here today with the TAC members. Um, and see if we wanted to, you know, maybe over the summer study this a little bit more. Um, I know that our former chairman, um, Tim Zagat, is somebody who also, you know, um, has, has reached out and said that this is something that he um, believes in. I am totally open-minded to this. I don't have an opinion on it. I don't know if it's feasible. So today, um, I, Ross and Kelly and I, we thought we would um, invite uh, Tom Martinelli, who is no stranger to TAC because he's he's been um, he's been participating in TAC for many years. He's the chief content officer of New York by Rail, Amtrak's guide to travel by rail destinations. And Donna Hayes, also a, a friend of TAC's, um, Donna is the assistant director of promotional partnerships at the MTA. And um, we'd love to hear their um, thoughts about you know, the direct link between rail here in New York and tourism and the growth of it. And also, I think if we were to continue this, we would have the New York State Department of Transportation join us, um, as well as some experts in high-speed rail. But we thought we'd take it, you know, with first with the, our friends to get an idea of what are the trends. So, Tom, um, you know, we'd love to hear from you first about what these possibilities are for increasing the use of uh, rail with tourists. and what can be done to attract more tourists with rail. Um, so Tom, thanks so much for joining us today. So unmute and, and we'd love to get your perspective. Okay, thanks for having me. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, so I think this is very timely and I really applaud uh, TAC for bringing the, the topic to uh, your discussion today. Uh, obviously it's very timely with all the national attention from the Biden administration about um, funds that would go towards infrastructure and improving the Amtrak system and just rail across the country. Um, you know, as you know, high-speed rail has been talked about in New York State for decades. So while I'm very optimistic that, you know, it, it is uh, getting a lot of attention now, um, there are a lot of issues uh, that are related to that in terms of what can be done. And I hope today that I could, you know, share some perspective from you. So next slide, please, uh, Kelly. Uh, just a little bit about New York by Rail. I think most of you are familiar with our annual print magazine. Um, I have been working to promote Amtrak for 18 years now. And uh, we've had a print magazine for 17 years, uh, which is visible on the trains and at stations. We have a very active website, NewYorkByRail.com. Uh, a weekly e-blast that many of you receive. We do blogs that are based on firsthand experiences of taking Amtrak to destinations and attractions. And uh, we also have social media sites. So we're reaching uh, the tourists, you know, during their trip, as well as during the planning stages. And we try to make it easier to plan an Amtrak 
uh, trip to make it as easy as possible. Next slide, please. So the Amtrak route map, um, there are 25 Amtrak stations throughout New York State, including Penn Station. Um, this means that a lot of our destinations throughout New York State uh, are reachable by Amtrak, either directly or indirectly uh, with, with a connection. Uh, you can go all the way up to the northern part of the Adirondacks uh, through uh, Albany and um, all the way to Niagara Falls in western New York. Um, as you know, there's been a lot of focus on, uh, through the governor, in improving uh, railroad stations, Amtrak stations. Most recently, Moynihan Train Hall uh, reopened in December. It is state-of-the-art, and it was you know, long overdue, but it's a great amenity for traveling uh, by Amtrak. Um, recently, Buffalo Exchange Station in uh, Buffalo uh, reopened through a massive uh, renovation. Uh, Schenectady, Rochester, and Niagara Falls have all had new stations renovated in the last five years. So there's been a lot of emphasis on uh, railroad stations. Next slide, please. Um, Amtrak uh, has a network which goes across the country. Um, there's 550 Amtrak stops. What that means for tourism is that there is an opportunity for uh, New York tourism to reach tourists coming across the country connecting through this network, uh, particularly through, uh, uh, through the Moynihan Train Hall. Um, you know, I know Ross and his team has put a lot of effort on um, the, uh, the, day uh, the, the drive market within a couple of miles. Well, I like to think that the train market within a couple of miles is also viable for another way for, for tourists to come to, uh, to New York. Um, Amtrak's ridership nationwide pre-pandemic was 31 million. So that represents an opportunity to get a lot of those people to come to New York State. Next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about what I believe tourists want to help to decide about taking an Amtrak getaway, um, because I know that that's where a lot of the focus is. First and foremost, we need to manage expectations, uh, particularly for the downstate going to upstate. I think all most of the tourism offices would would uh, agree that the New York City market is the prime, uh, you know, target market. So, you know, we do a lot of our work to manage expectations for people coming out of New York City. And if you're managing expectations, obviously ticket cost is a consideration, but it's not always the primary consideration. I think the train ride duration is more important, um, and we look at it based on how long is the train ride from New York City. Uh, to Albany, it's two and a half hours. That's very manageable. But to Niagara Falls, it's nine hours. So therefore, I think that's why ridership to Niagara Falls, uh, pre-pandemic, about 30000 per year only. Um, you know, it, it's, it's hard for people to spend that amount of time. You have to be a real train lover. Uh, the schedule needs to be convenient. How often are the trains running? If I'm doing a weekend getaway, can I come back on a Sunday night? Um, what are the connections from the train stations, uh, particularly tourists coming up from New York City? They have all sorts of uh, ways to get around through mass transit. But when you're in upstate New York, what are the services that are available? Can you, is there, is there, are there rental cars? Are there shuttles? Are there, is there public transportation? Is ride sharing available? Can I get around without a car? Um, can I take Amtrak to major events? Can I take Amtrak to the Saratoga race course, to SPAC? Can I go to the New York State Fair? Can I go to uh, major events. It's not always easy to get to those uh, locations, and that's why the connections are very important. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the ridership, um, and I'm uh, going to highlight the Empire West Maple Leaf service, which is uh, Western New York. So this is anything west of Schenectady, just by way of example. And Amtrak had shared some uh, data with me and it points to the primary reason that people take Amtrak is comfort, relaxation, and enjoyment. The second reason is price and a unique train experience. And the third reason is a convenient schedule and would rather not fly. And I think today, more than any time, I think we have a real opportunity to capture some of the people that don't want to fly and get them on trains. Uh, the demographics, 69% of People riding Amtrak to Western New York are non-business commuters. 45% um, visiting family, 24% vacation. 
They spend an average of four nights during their stay uh, to Western New York. That's a real opportunity for a tourist to go into the restaurants, the attractions, and that's where you're going to get the real uh, economic benefit. So I think that, you know, there is certainly a lot of opportunity. Next slide, please. What are some of the rail advantages for tourists? Um, well, taking the train can be part of your vacation experience. It's enjoyable. You can roam around. It's eco-friendly. Now, more than ever, with the green movement, Amtrak is, uh, is definitely right there. And there's the in-demand. You can go city to city. You don't have to go from an airport to downtown. Um, next slide, please. So one of the products that New York by Rail came up with, just by way of an example, which I consider to be a tourist-friendly product, is the New York by Rail travel package. You have to make it easy if you're going to want to have people get on the train. So we modeled this after another package for another state. We work with a professional operator, and we have um, roughly um, – uh, 17 packages. We work with hotels, attractions, and we were starting to gain momentum thanks to a uh, Market New York grant uh, until the pandemic hit. But I believe that this is something that makes it easier for people to travel uh, because it's all inclusive. It, it, it makes it easier. Next slide, please. So getting into how to enhance the New York State Amtrak service for tourists. Um, I think it's very important to educate the New York State tourism industry. Christine, you mentioned possibly having this on the agenda for future uh, meetings. I, I think education is very important. If the tourism community believes that Amtrak's important, then the powers to be will do the things that need to do to make it more viable. And I, you know, as, as I go around, I try to talk to anyone who can from the, uh, the chambers to the TPAs to any other organizations. And, um, you know, education is very important. I think it's important to understand how Amtrak operates in New York State. Um, Amtrak uh, in New York is part of what's called a state-supported service. That means that New York pays for the service, uh, any of the costs for operations and capital north of Penn Station. So it, this is a line item in the New York State, and we pay approximately $40 million for our Amtrak service because it runs at a deficit, which is not unusual. It's very important to understand this because if we want to get things done in New York, we don't have to go to Washington to get them done. They can be done through our state. If our legislature uh, decides to, you know, enact the, uh, the resources available, you know, it can be done. I think we need to look at growth opportunities, um, particularly in upstate and western New York. Currently, the New York to Albany corridor um, gets very good traffic. Albany is the ninth busiest Amtrak station in the nation, and Hudson and Rhinecliff are in the top 50. But the Western New York ridership can certainly stand to improve. And I think in terms of getting uh, economic benefit for upstate, I think Amtrak can be very instrumental in this. Um, so a lot of the decisions are made locally. What kind of decisions can they be? We could add train frequencies. We can lower the ticket prices. We can decide to add passenger amenities. Currently, the cafe car between New York and Albany doesn't have any service. Um, when it does have service, we serve uh, Taste New York products. It's a great way to promote those products and promote tourism and educate people about um, what there is in New York State. Um, you've all heard about the infrastructure bill that the Biden administration is proposing. Um, that is going to have a, a huge benefit to uh, to rail and to Amtrak. Amtrak um, would receive a, a significant amount of money. $85 billion is earmarked currently uh, to modernize public transit. And, uh, but you have to understand that New York is part of what's called a state-supported service. There's 29 state-supported services throughout New York State. We have three of them. There's two for Empire Service and one for the Adirondack. We're competing for 26 other uh, any uh, other states that are also vying for money. Um, Amtrak has announced the 20, Amtrak 2035 initiative. Those are the new routes. How would the country look? A lot of the focus is on the Midwest. It's on the South. It's routes like uh, going from Atlanta to Nashville, to go from uh, Columbus to Cleveland, to go from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. Where is New York in that discussion? Um, you know, essentially what they're talking about is adding one more service per day and then having a day train that would go uh, through Cleveland. So, again, we have to speak up. You know, while the while the iron is hot, this is the time to do it. 
Um, obviously, Senator Kennedy has introduced uh, a rail bill, uh, S3185. Uh, uh, it's looking at high-speed rail. Uh, it's looking at pointing a, a commission. I think that's great. Um, you know, I know that we don't, one of the shortcomings in New York is we don't have a state rail plan. Uh, the FRA requires it to be updated every four years. Ours is about 10 years old. Um, there was a high-speed rail study done uh, that started in 2014. It's never been completed. So there are some things, you know, that are existing already that, you know, I think would bring us uh, into uh, some areas of improvement. So lastly, uh, next slide, I just wanted to, you know, discuss a few other things that have to attract more tourists to rail. Um, I think we need to build a bigger, uh, a, a, a stronger New York State rail program by investing in reliable service and speed improvements. It doesn't have to be high speed to the extent that what you would see in Europe or Asia. If we can get to 90 miles an hour, if we can get to 110 miles an hour, higher speed, if we can get more reliable service, trains running on time, that would be a big improvement, you know, currently, and it can be done fairly quickly. Um, I think there needs to be a better alignment with I Love New York and the I Love New York tourist programs. Um, you know, I, I, DOT right now is the quarterback, and, um, you know, they uh, probably could work with I Love New York and work on a program to get more tourists. I think we could leverage I Love New York marketing dollars to enhance the New York State Amtrak marketing, which comes out of Washington. So I think there should be more emphasis on passenger amenities. Uh, better Wi-Fi service, open the cafe cars, as I mentioned, and promote the Taste New York products. Um, bikes on the train is a huge development. We have the Empire State Trail. They're talking about 35% of that target is bikers. How can we get bikers from New York City up to the Empire State Trail? Amtrak route mirrors the Empire State Trail. It's a big opportunity. We should be taking advantage of it. Um, we should encourage skiers from the New York City area to take Amtrak to the ski resorts, but we need connections to the resorts. So that gets to this last mile connectivity um, so that you can go from an Amtrak station and you can go to attractions, wineries, major events, second homes, and, and other places where you're going. Um, you know, it's not easy. This would require ongoing uh, tourist rail product development. It's hard work. But I think we, there's a lot that needs to be done, but this is definitely the time to do it. I think there's a huge opportunity for more tourists uh, riding Amtrak. And I think if we, you know, collectively work together, I, I think we can see some measurable uh, results from this. So that, that's what I wanted to talk about. I'm happy to ask, answer any questions at any point. Thanks so much, Tom. That was really in, very interesting. I learned a lot. Um, and I do want to make sure that, Donna, we have time um, to hear from you um, more on, on a local basis on what the MTA is doing in order to make sure that visitors feel that they can be using the rails. Um, and what can we look forward to, if, if anything, how would the MTA deal with high-speed rail? Uh, would that impact the, the current rail lines and, and whatnot? Right. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, I uh, are you? Do you have my first slide up? I'm not. I'm yeah. Not sure. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. The delay is so it's so crazy. I'm gonna look at my presentation and um, just um, not look at uh, your your screen. So um, yeah, this is Metro North um, Leisure Travel, and um, there's there's definitely a lot of overlap with um, with Amtrak when it comes to the Lower Hudson Valley, and then you know Metro North kind of is the uh, the gateway to um, the rest of upstate New York. And um, I just wanted to you know just uh, kind of step back and look um, at our 2019 um, ridership stats. Um, it's always a good, it's, it's a benchmark for us at this point for where we need to get back to and where we can potentially go from there. Um, so um, next slide. So just looking at um, the 2019 stats, um, you know, we were um, in a really strong place in, in 2019 with um, ridership at 86.6 million. Um, and that was up from 2018. So it was looking really, really great. And um, the Hudson Line in particular, 
um, was was doing really well. Um, you know, definitely um, breaking records. Um, and you know, we we know that um, there's uh, again when we're talking about the the gateway to the the rest of New York State, um, the Hudson Line um, is is right up there. Um, you know, with with um, allowing that that um, to, to happen. Um, we know um, that our ridership for leisure travel in particular, we're able to track that through our getaway program with our discount rail, discount admission packages. And many of those packages um, are in the Hudson Valley. Um, we have you know, some that go on the Hudson line, some that go on the Harlem line, going up you know, through the Harlem Valley rail. And then we have uh, some on the New Haven line. But um, our numbers were looking terrific for um, 2019. We had 113,000 um, rides related to um, those packaging. And so now here we find ourselves, you, you can go to the, the next slide, please. So here we find ourselves in 2020 and 2021, you know, just seeing such a, a shift, um, you know, with COVID, um, you know, the, between the, the shutdown and then, you know, just finding now that so many people are working from home, um, you know, we, we feel like um, we have to, we're just basically kind of reintroducing taking the train to um, our customers. Um, and we um, came up with a campaign this spring where, you know, just like kind of thinking, um, you know, okay, if home has become your office, we'd like, um, you know, New York City uh, and the Hudson Valley and, you know, the, the overall um, area to become your playground. Um, so we had this campaign come out and play, um, you know, just trying to, to get folks in our service area um, to come back down to the city and enjoy the, the, um, the venues that were open. Um, and we knew that, um, you know, there was a, a pent up, you know, um, demand for, um, you know, folks that lived in the city to come up to the Hudson Valley and, and Connecticut just to, to, you know, get on the train and get out of the city. That was a, a lot stronger for us. We found that, you know, folks were coming up to the, the parks and the trails and, um, you know, coming, coming up to um, restaurants and so forth in the Hudson Valley. Um, you know, all through the, the pandemic, they were, they were um, getting on the train and coming up. Um, and so what we're seeing, um, the, the next slide, please, just looking at um, the ridership at this point, um, you know, the weekend ridership is coming back faster than the, the daily ridership. And um, we're at the point where, you know, again, we're, we're always comparing the numbers from 2019 pre-COVID to where we stand now. And when you look at the numbers, um, the, the weekend ridership is, you know, we're like almost at the halfway point where, you know, or we're just past the halfway point where we're seeing that um, the weekend ridership is, is really starting to, to rebound. Next slide, please. So um, we're looking um, with our social media campaigns where we're really kind of trying to spark that, that love again for um, coming back to the city or um, just travel in, in general. And, you know, we have posts where we're showing, um, you know, beautiful scenes in, in the Hudson Valley. Um, and likewise, we um, have posts that are, you know, just getting people excited about um, Grand Central again. Um, and so this particular post um, that I put, um, falling in love again with Grand Central, um, where we're just showing, you know, that, that idea, um, meet me at the clock, you know, because that's what everyone used to do, you know, it was always a thing coming into to Grand Central. And so, um, you know, we're just, when you do that, when you put posts like that, you know, it kind of sparks this, this discussion with folks. And, you know, this particular person is talking about being excited about coming back into the city. And, you know, once you get that kind of buzz going, um, you know, it's kind of infectious, you know, it makes you like, yeah, gosh, yeah, you know, I do want to get on the train again, I do want to do that. And so that's the whole idea of it. Um, and then, um, 
you know, overall, there's a, a campaign that launched last week, um, Take the Train, um, when the train, the subway started, um, you know, coming back for 24-hour service again. Um, and we're just like kind of welcoming people back, um, you know, getting on the subways. And once you're on the subway, then it's, you know, then you're, then you're on the train, then you're just like kind of moving through the system again and just like kind of jumpstarting that. Because with tourists, it's like it, it really kind of, in this case, it starts at home. And we know that there's a pent up demand for, you know, just getting out again and starting to do things. And we don't want them to turn around and, you know, take a road trip to Pennsylvania when they can take a road trip, you know, um, you know, get on the train and, and come up to the Hudson Valley or go out to Long Island or whatever. We want to kind of keep them home and moving through um, our system because we have so much to, to offer. We offer access to so much. So um, again, I'm sorry, gosh, I, I don't even know if we're together with the slides. I'm so sorry. Let me see where you guys are. Let me see. Okay, not, not too far behind. Um, next slide, please. So um, the Take the Train campaign and just kind of looking at this um, system-wide, um, you know, we have, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, talking up taking the subway, we're talking up taking Metro North, taking Long Island Railroad, and, you know, we really feel like we have a lot to offer. There's been a lot going on with, you know, keeping the subway and the trains clean and, um, you know, the filtration systems and, and everything, and it's really you know, um, a very welcoming environment that, that we feel that, that people will be very excited to, to connect with again. And we're, you know, just want to get those families and, and everybody on the, the train again. So um, next slide, please. So um, in addition to, you know, just, you know, just knowing what our programs are, knowing where um, you know we we have access to um, where our trains go, we feel like we're in a position to kind of reimagine um, the success that that we can um, can you know kind of bring forth. And um, one of the things that we're doing is like kind of looking at when you consider what's happening on the infrastructure side. Um, next slide, please. You know, just looking at um, connectivity and Christine, you talk about um, high speed, high speed rail. Um, you know, I think that um, you, you mentioned the, um, you know, the, the access to Penn Station project. And that's really exciting because it's, it's high speed in a sense because they're really kind of cutting down um, the, the travel time and, you know, just like um, broadening the capacity, um, you know, for, for getting people into the city and out of the city, it's because it's, it's definitely going to work both ways. And um, so the, the um, New Haven line service, the Penn Station, um, we're going to really be able to, you know, if you can imagine, be able to get um, tourists up, you know, to the, the Bronx, to, they could go to, um, um, you know, City Island. They could go to um, Orchard Beach. You know, there's there's so many possibilities in going up that way. And then, likewise, when you consider the hotels in Westchester that um, run shuttle service, um, you know, to and from the Metro North train station, we could conceivably have people that are coming from New England and staying in those hotels in Westchester and day tripping into the city and doing a hub and spoke so easily, it would be really, really exciting. So um, the, the information that, that you shared about the um, New Haven Lawn Service to Penn Station is, is such a real thing. And likewise, the Long Island Railroad um, East Side Access Project um, going into Grand Central, not only does it enhance the, the um, experience of, of Grand Central as a destination, it creates this hub where people can have access to going out to Long Island to the beaches and all of the, the venues that Long Island has to offer. And then likewise, you know, they're just getting into, um, you know, Manhattan and connecting with Metro North in a way that we've, we haven't had before. So um, that's 
that's slated to um, to open in 2022. And, um, you know, I think it's going to be really, really exciting. I've seen pictures of of um, Eastside Access, you know, the way that level looks, and it's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so on to the next slide. Um, just looking at um, the um, mobile connection um, that's, you know, going to be going on um, is a project that's going to be starting, um, you know, next year. Um, and we're um, really excited about that because, you know, um, if you've ever taken Metro North, you know, you go through um, dead spots here or there. You know, it could, it could definitely um, cut out and come, comes back in. Um, likewise, when you get out, um, you know, far uh, on Long Island Railroad. So um, this is, um, a, you know, a really important project for us, especially when you consider there are so many um, mobile apps now um, that offer tours and they're um, GPS activated. Um, there's one for um, Scenic Hudson has one um, for, you know, just um, all of the, it's like a window seat tour from, um, you know, taking the, the Hudson line and looking out the window and connecting with this mobile app that allows you to just kind of see um, you know, and learn the history and so forth and so on. So imagine being able to have this mobile app and, you know, tourists can enjoy the experience, um, you know, right from their, their window seat and, and not have any connectivity issues. So again, that's a, a really exciting, um, you know, activity um, or effort that's, that's underway on the infrastructure side. Um, and on the marketing side, um, connectivity is a, a major deal for us right now because for the first time ever, um, Metro North, Long Island Railroad, um, buses and subways are all under one roof working together for a seamless approach to leisure travel marketing. And um, it's really kind of cool because, um, you know, Long Island Railroad and Metro North are looking at all of the venues that they have in common and kind of getting them all on the same page so that someone that's in New York City can suddenly realize that like, wait, I can spend one day um, at the wineries out um, on the east end of Long Island and the next day I can get on Metro North and come up to the Hudson Valley and enjoy um, the wineries. And so on both ends, they get to experience, um, you know, so much, you know, um, or, you know, they're going to the beach, you know, one day um, on Long Island and the next day they're doing a river cruise um, out in the Hudson Valley. So it, they get the both uh, best of both worlds. So one thing that we're doing is creating a microsite, um, a leisure travel microsite, where we'll be able to feature all of these, you know, destinations, um, attractions, happenings, and everything is is there under one umbrella. And it'll be a series of articles. Um, it'll be special authors. We're going to work with the TPAs, um, you know, uh, to to get some content from them. It could either be, you know, they could feature some of the hotel packages that they have, um, you know, things that are happening, everything that's accessible by MTA. So um, that's, that's more to come. We're um, going to do a soft launch in July. And um, this is, this is something that we're really excited about. Um, it's, it's the first collaborative effort from, you know, the railroads and, and the subways. Um, and then next slide, please. We um, also have a um, ad campaign that we're developing. Um, it's it's featured in the the subways right now. It's in the subways. Um, it's um, throughout Metro North system and Long Island Railroad system, and it's really um, kind of exciting to again to see um, that there's this really group, um, very driven effort to promote tourist destinations, attractions, um, you know, all kinds of, of venues that are accessible by, by Metro North, Long Island Railroad, and, and Subway. Um, just, just be able to have this presence in the subway system and talk to, 
um, New York City um, residents about getting out and and just having you know the, the best of of everything. Um, I don't think that we've had this kind of marketing push on the tourism side since the days of um, promoting MetroCard and trying to get um, folks back on the subway um, on the subway using MetroCard. Um, there was a, a big push to get domestic visitors um, and international visitors comfortable using um, MetroCard when when it came on on board, and that was like in the 90s. Christine, you probably remember that with um, your days of being at um, NYC and company. And um, MTA was doing a, a big push to help um, with the, the industry with um, with tourism. And I feel like we're at that stage again where we're working together with everyone to, to really support um, you know, tourism on a uh, MTA system-wide um, basis. Um, the next campaign that you'll see coming out in the subways will be um, featuring, um, you know, some of the, the museums and, and some of the attractions in New York City. Um, and so Donna, are, um, yeah. I'm going to just, I'm yeah, going to have sorry. to, um, we're going to have to wrap it up because we have a hard stop. Um, and I do want to get to some questions if anybody has, and also new business if they have, but, um, it is exciting that the MTA is going to be doing its own ad campaign. I was not aware of that. And, um, you know, I have heard Pat Foy on a couple of Zooms, um, mm -hmm. and it seems like the most important issue to get out right now is what the MTA is doing as far as public safety on the mm -hmm. on the subway. So I think he's addressing that by adding more, not only NYPD, but also additional officers that the MTA is, is going to be putting yeah. out on their own. So I think that'll go a long way on making tourists feel more comfortable getting back on the yes. subways and then you can do your job more easily, I would think, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, yes. But um, thank you so much to, to Donna and Tom. Um, it, it, does anybody have any questions on this? And, and also you can email me and, and Ross and Kelly because we do want to see if we should continue on this line of thinking um, and bring it forward on this, more on the high speed, um, rail, um, and if there are any experts that you think we should bring in to discuss that. Any questions on this or any new business? Does any? And I think Thurman Thomas has joined us. So welcome, Thurm. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Always glad to be here. Right. Okay. So. I think we will then wrap up a little bit early since I don't see any hands or questions or waving. So, um, but again, this was very informative and I think that's the first step because I learned a lot as far as what's going on with rail. Um, so I thank um, Tom and Donna. Um, and also wanted to let you know that our next meeting is scheduled for Monday, September 27th at 11 a.m. Um, and we are planning on having that meeting in person and we're planning on having it at the Javits Center. So I hope you can arrange your schedule so that you can come into New York, into the city, because we do wanna show you, even though the meeting is, is normally from 11 to 12.30, but Alan Steele um, may be able to give us a tour of the renovated section of the Javits Center either before or after. So we'll try and nail that down quickly so then you can um, schedule accordingly. Um, but what's exciting is not only the expansion, but the, they just announced um, a meeting that's going into Javits. So the first one, I think, is scheduled for August 19th. It's the former gift show, but I think it's called New York Now, which is a pretty big show. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, we've been very uh, optimistic. I know NYC and company is really chomping at the bit to be able to get Javits reopened for trade shows um, even before August. Uh, and now with the CDC uh, and the lifting of a lot of the restrictions, we're hoping that Javits can open up even, even sooner because we know that that will be a very important message to send to the business community. So it's all exciting. Um, so we'll see you with the Javits on Monday, the 27th. Um, so I think it, so thank you very much for your time and continue to stay healthy and safe. And I do need a motion to adjourn. <laughs> so.
So moved. Anthony, your first meeting, and you're done. I'm, I'm so you're jumping right in. I am very excited about this. <laughs> okay, I need a second. I see Catherine. You've got your yes, second. Okay, all right, Catherine Nichols. So there we are. So our meeting is now adjourned at twelve twenty-four. So all be well, and uh, we'll see you. Have a great summer, and and we will be in touch by email to continue uh, the discussion on what's going on in the summer. Great meeting. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.